Hey guys, welcome back. As long as Elon Musk is going on about colonizing Mars, I think it would be a good idea to see what that would be like. Welcome to my first ever full video game review. I've wanted to do these for a while, so let's not waste any time. Mars Warlogs is an action RPG game with a heavy focus on melee combat and lightning powers. It takes place on Mars post-colonization. You see, after the human race got a whole civilization's worth of people to this planet, it shifted on its axis a tiny bit and the sunlight became lethal. Contact with Earth was lost. Elon is nowhere to be found. This is bad. Giant metal sunroofs have been erected over all the cities so you can go outside without dying, and now it's been almost a hundred years since this happened and water is more precious than gold. There are no real guns here, since that wouldn't be punk. Instead, people use pipes, clubs, and knives to fight, with the only ranged weapons being nail guns that fire slowly and have very limited ammunition. At some point, certain people gained the ability to discharge massive amounts of electricity, and these people became the Technomancers. Think of them as a combination between religious figures and military generals. They talk themselves up to be messiah figures and use the lightning powers as proof. There are two colonies, Abundance and Aurora. I mean, there are more, but only Abundance and Aurora really matter. They're currently at war, hence the name Warlogs. You play as Roy, a somewhat two-dimensional but still serviceable protagonist. He used to be a technomancer, but now is a prisoner of war in an abundance camp. I'm going to be rather light on details regarding the story from here on out, since it's honestly not amazing. It has its fans, and I won't knock you if you like it, but we are all here for the gameplay, not Roy's winning personality. So let's get to that. After a very long intro narrated by some effeminate British dude, we get to walk around the prison camp. And honestly? Despite being on Mars, this is one of the nicest prison camps I've ever been to. The prisoners get food, gardens, tables to play poker at, very little supervision, there are jobs to do, people to fight, mysteries to solve. Like, why are all the mutant dogs going rabid? Why is Bob the guard depressed? It's amazing. Best prison ever. So while we plan our escape, let's talk about the combat. Right off the bat, it's a little weird. I wouldn't call it bad, I mean I had fun, but it definitely takes a minute to get used to. You can swing your improvised weapon with the left mouse, hold the right mouse to block attacks. If you time the block just right, you parry and knock enemies off balance a little bit. You also get a guard break attack to punch through an enemy's defenses. You have a ton of slots for abilities, but right now you have no skill, so all you can do in the beginning is throw sand in people's eyes. It blinds them unless they're wearing goggles which, why wouldn't you? Post-apocalyptic desert life is worthless if you can't strap a pair of big black goggles around your head and add little spikes to them. Come on. You can roll to dodge, which is good for escaping a fight when you're losing. Attacking is a little inconsistent, since Roy will occasionally do a ballerina twirl before attacking, which takes longer than just swinging the pipe. It has no tactical advantage that I can discern, so I have to assume Roy is just spinning because it looks cool. You have a random chance of dealing a critical hit to an enemy, which does double the damage. The prison section is about as hard as the game gets, since you have no electric powers and limited access to crafting. Once you can shoot lightning from your hands, the game kind of stops being challenging. Like I mentioned before, you have a bunch of side quests you can do for XP and other rewards. I absolutely recommend doing every prison side quest you can find, because they give you so much XP that you basically level up every time you complete one. Speaking of which, level up. Every time you level up, you gain two skill points and one character point. Skill points give you new abilities and stat boosts, and character points give you new abilities and stat boosts. That may sound like I just said the same thing twice, and that's because I just said the same thing twice. I don't know why these are separate, <laughs> honestly, but whatever. As far as skill points go, it depends on what you like. There are three branches, Renegade, Combat, and Technomancy. Technomancy is locked for now. Combat gives you direct advantages, such as higher crit chance, boosted damage, higher crit chance after rolling, better guard breaks, that sort of thing. Renegade is sort of the odd one out, as it improves stealth, improves the power of nail guns, allows you to wound your enemies, which is a status effect that drains their health and slows their movement speed, and lets you craft grenades and explosive traps. There's also a morality system in place. Do evil stuff and you get a bad rep. Do good stuff, vice versa. One of the funniest things about this world is the serum syringe. So Mars uses serum as currency. How do you get serum? Well, you can find it in boxes in the pockets of people you just beat up, but where does it come from? It's people. Serum is people. See, after you win a fight, the people you've just shot, clubbed over the head, electrocuted, or all three aren't actually dead, just severely wounded. You can use a syringe to extract serum from their bodies, killing them and receiving in return five serum. It is genuinely one of the stupidest currency systems I've ever heard of, and I also find it really funny. Killing people is a bad action. You can easily give yourself a very bad reputation by doing this. 
business. But it has its benefits, aside from the money. A bad rep means you can intimidate people in conversations, plus you can unlock a higher crit chance and ability to wound enemies by being terrible. Having a good reputation gives you a discount with merchants and improves companions' damage. Companions aren't all that good, so honestly just go with the evil actions if you care about efficiency. It's not like having to pay more for materials matters much when your wallet is weighed down by the souls of all the people you've killed. I did two and a half playthroughs of Mars, one focusing on each skill tree. Let's start with the first, where I dumped almost all of my points into Technomancy. It was some of the most fun I've ever had in a video game in a while, let me tell ya. During the prison section, I didn't spend more than a couple points, saving almost all of them for when I eventually unlocked the Technomancy tree. When I did, I went on a shopping spree, unlocking the most powerful abilities in the game. Technomancy has three basic attacks. Lightning Bolt, Electric Weapon, and a Disruption Field. Lightning Bolt is my personal favorite. It damages and stuns enemies. With enough upgrades, the lightning will chain off enemies too, practically doubling its effect since you now almost always hit two people with every one attack. My kind of game. Electric Weapon is your workhorse damage-wise. You can run an electric charge through your club or knife of choice, increasing its damage. Do this to a powerful enough weapon and you can basically kill everything except Technomancers in three hits. Less if you get criticals. The Technomancers will take five to seven hits, but that's fine. The disruption attack is designed purely to knock enemies off balance, and thus is rarely going to kill people unless they're already really injured. You can make it cover a wider area, disrupt multiple people at once, do more damage, and give it a chance of stunning opponents. This creates some nice opportunities for combo attacks, but I rarely used it because I spent all my points upgrading lightning bolt and electric weapon, so I didn't have any to spare. The other ability I didn't use much was a personal force field. Roy can surround himself in an electromagnetic bubble that not only reduces damage, but can reflect incoming attacks back on enemies. It's probably good, but I've never upgraded it very far because, again, I'm addicted to lightning bolts and do not have any points left over for trivialities like protection. The final ability in the tree that isn't just a stat boost is Overload, and I find it really interesting. It costs half your mana bar to use, but then you begin to rapidly build energy for a few seconds. This allows you to really cut loose with your attacks, throwing lightning and disruption fields in every direction. But if you let the mana bar fill up, you explode, sending energy out in all directions, bottoming out the mana bar and leaving you stunned for a few seconds. That's a fascinating ability. It practically forces you to constantly use lightning attacks to keep from exploding, but if you want, you can turn yourself into a human grenade. It's pretty valuable when fighting big groups since you can do huge amounts of lightning damage to clusters of enemies, and if they get too close, you can just let yourself blow up. It doesn't kill you, but it can easily kill the enemy. So that's Technomancy, and it is nearly unstoppable. Nothing can threaten you once you have this much power. Not even other Technomancers, who are somehow far, far less competent than Roy. This was also my evil playthrough, where I drained every single person I knocked down for serum and as a result was never hurting for cash. I bought a fine copper bar and covered it in razor blades and barbed wire, and this combined with electric weapon meant that I was basically never in any real danger again. Halfway through the story, you're given a choice. You can join the Pragmatic General Honor to try and beat the bad guys from the inside, or join the Idealistic Rebellion to beat the government from the outside. Oh yeah, remember the effeminate Brit that narrated the intro? He's in the game! His name is Innocence, and no, I'm not joking. Aurora has a habit of naming people after virtues. Or was it abundance? I don't remember. Like parsimony, sobriety, honesty. Very few of them display any virtue, but I guess you tried. Anyway, Innocence wants to join the Rebellion. He does! And then he gets kidnapped. Oh no! Roy lost his innocence! Anyway, at this point I have to choose my team. Well, Innocence would want me to join the Rebellion, so naturally I join General Honor instead. The moment you pick a side, Innocence is kicked out of the story. If you go against his wishes and side with a general, he gets exiled and never returns. If you do what he would want and join the Rebellion, he's put in front of a firing squad in a scene that is really trying to be moving and sad. You have Innocence singing one final song inside his head, but this sudden influx of pathos is kind of overshadowed by the fact that the entire cast of protagonists is just watching him die and doing nothing because the enemy has a single machine gun that is pointed the opposite direction. I choose to believe that Innocence was so annoying that nobody was willing to risk their lives to save him. Oh well. Either way, Innocence leaves the story. I always find it funny when a game presents a choice to me where the outcome is basically always the same, but the circumstances are slightly different. Like, Innocence dying versus Innocence being exiled only makes a difference if you personally like the character. I do not. 
so the choice feels really pointless. Oh well, like I said before, the story is just kind of serviceable at best, and almost nobody is here for the story of Mars, Warlogs. After Innocence's exile, Roy joins up with the General to try and undo the Technomancers once and for all. We do a bit of running around, fight a giant worm, awesome, just awesome, and finally mount our final attack on the Technomancer HQ. It's a swarm, guards everywhere and multiple Technomancers. I guess I haven't gone too in-depth on them yet. Well, there isn't much depth to go into. Technomancers have all the same abilities as you, but do them far slower and far less frequently. You could kill them about as easily as anyone else, but on death, they explode. Okay, that's kind of unique. The Technomancers can also hit their own allies with their attacks, which I think is hilarious. They just do not care if their own troops are between you and them. They will throw lightning, hitting their troops, their dogs, and maybe you. After fighting your way through, you come across the Dowser, basically the prime minister of this whole affair. He's basically trying to cure himself of a rabid disease and thus gave the Technomancers almost unlimited political power to find him a cure, which is what led to all the bad stuff they were doing that I didn't talk about because I don't care. The general kills him and then turns his gun on Roy, you know, the guy who can shoot lightning, but Roy is a step ahead. He says he's been keeping a diary of everything the general has been doing and has been sure it will be published if he dies, so the general lets us go. Roy narrates the epilogue, letting us know that he's off to rejoin Innocence in Exile and that the general is basically erecting a fascist police state thanks to our help. Uh... Whoops. Hey, this means that Innocence surviving is the bad ending. I love it when my expectations are met. Okay, that was a little grim. Let's take a look at my second playthrough where I was all in on combat and making good choices. The combat tree is similar in power to Technomancy. Instead of lightning and shields, all your power is consolidated into hitting stuff. There are almost no new abilities in this tree, just stat boosts. Increased roll distance, crit chance, damage done, that sort of thing. The one ability in this tree is called Combat Trance, and it allows you to spend half your mana bar to put the world in slow motion for a little bit. It's, uh, incredibly overpowered, to be honest. I like it. Combining combat trance with an electric weapon is essentially like being a Jedi. You move significantly faster than everyone else and kill things almost just by touching them with your melee weapon. On this playthrough, I joined the Resistance. Innocence dies, yes, and I allow Mary to join my team. She's a former Technomancer like me I didn't mention the first time around. I thought of it as an extra challenge, trying to make fights a bit more difficult, as, like with all Technomancers, Mary can easily hit me with her attacks. In fact, she will hit me. A lot. But on the bright side, if you time it right, you and her can combine attacks on single targets. In my evil playthrough, I just killed her. Oh, and in case you're wondering, no, I don't have the option to give her more clothes. I asked her about it and she said the shredded Jess represented her past or whatever. This story is a lot better when you don't ask questions. Somebody's betraying us. Who's betraying us? Margo? Well, knock it off! Me, the Resistance Leader, and Mary all together storm the Technomancer HQ. It's the same fight as before, but with Combat Trance I can actually run up to the Technomancers and kill them before they have time to put up a shield. It still isn't really difficult. We go into the Bow- The Bowser's office. <laughs> I'm keeping it in, I'm keeping it in. We go into the Dowser's office to find that Honor has already killed Wisdom. He turns himself in, and we have the option to spare or kill him. I spared his life since this was supposed to be a good guy run, and the good ending is Roy leaving the Warlog, eh, 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 title drop, at Innocence's burned up home, saying that even though he isn't sure if he did the right thing, there is hope for the future. After all, it's not like we helped erect a fascist police state. Phew, that's the two endings. Despite minor differences, I don't think I left out anything important. The story is bare bones, just enough to give everyone some motivation. It's weak, I don't like it very much. The best part is this big worm, I call him Barry. For my final playthrough, I didn't complete the game a third time. I'd already done so twice in a very short amount of time and didn't want to go through the whole thing again. I just wanted to get far enough to see how Renegade affects combat. So I basically just played through the prison section and a little bit after, and eh, it's interesting. Stealth gives you some interesting advantages. Being able to knock people unconscious with one strike and hide the bodies is fun, but it rarely matters. There are points later in the game where you go through a door and are confronted by five or six guys all staring directly at you. I'm not going to stealth my way out of this one, and this is a very common occurrence. Sometimes a guards are scattered about in a way that is just not conducive to sneaking, as approaching any of them will guarantee me getting caught. The one time I was able to do stealth properly was in this mole cavern. There are a couple moles patrolling and the rest are all sleeping, so if you make too much noise, they wake up. I was able to incapacitate every one of them without starting a fight. This might sound impressive, until I tell you that the moles don't actually have eyes. So yes, the stealth in this game is good, so long as the enemy is literally blind. But the renegade tree isn't just about stealth. 
that also contains upgrades to nail guns and explosives. So let's see how much better that... Oh, the fight's already over. Yeah, the nail gun gets extremely powerful with enough upgrades. So much so that I kind of want to ignore everything else and just use the nail gun. It does so much damage from the longest range on top of inflicting the wounded status effect that I have to wonder why I would bother with lightning at all. But let's make this definitive. How does a nail gun fare against the Technomancer? Gun versus lightning. Pretentious dork versus cynical cardboard. Look, I don't know what to say. If you want to curb stomp the entirety of Mars, then ignore combat and lightning. Just upgrade the nail gun and set aside some time to collect bits and bobs to craft into more nails. You can also drain people's brains for money to buy more ammo, and as long as you have some in stock, you cannot lose. Oh, and as for the grenades, well, they work about as well as they do in real life once you've upgraded them. Yeah, that's Mars Warlogs. At the end of the day, do I recommend getting this game? Yes, with caveats. The gameplay is fun, especially with how easy it is to break it. The story is utterly worthless, but give me a chuckle or two with how implausible and nonsensical it all is. And at the end of the day, it's only five bucks on Steam. I got a good 30 hours of fun out of it, all told. Oh, and somebody send this game to Elon Musk just so that he knows precisely what he's getting us all into if he succeeds in colonizing Mars. But if he does, I hope he abandons all pretense at fair government and just declares himself king of Mars. That's all. Like, subscribe, and get out. Video's over.